I'd like to recognize and thank our sponsors. One reason we could go deeper and uh, with our celebration is because of our sponsors, and they really deserve our thanks and appreciation. Today, our gold sponsor is the Nellie May Education Foundation. Our silver sponsors, Bank America of America and Webster Bank. And the brown, bronze sponsors are Bloom Shapiro and the New Alliance Foundation. We want to thank you. We appreciate your support for the council and its work. Thank you. We're very pleased today to have with us Udaya Pat Patniak, uh, a founder and principal of JUMP, a strategy consulting firm that partners with visionary leaders to create new businesses and reinvent existing ones. He helps clients manage innovation, create and commercialize new businesses, and transform organizations, which is why he's here today. We're all in for transformation, a little, uh, little this afternoon at least. Udaya uses his skills in systems thinking, facilitation, and road mapping to advise executives in technology, healthcare, consumer packaged goods, philanthropy, and retail. Over the years, he's worked with leaders not only from philanthropy, but Hewlett Packard, Target, Harley Davidson, and Clorox to serve, to help them solve long-term strategy issues while delivering rapid results. He is a frequent speaker on using innovation to drive growth. Prior to Jump, he worked in community and economic development, providing technical assistance in finance, policies, and systems improvement. He also, in his spare time, teaches at Stanford University Graduate School of Business and holds a degree in civil engineering, also from Stanford. It is our great pleasure to welcome Udaya. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we all doing? Can everybody hear me? No. Yes, you can. All right, good. Uh, so uh, thanks again for, uh, for taking the time to be here. Uh, we want to talk today about you can't hear me. Okay. Well, let's try that one more time. Can you hear me? <laughs> OK, we're good. All right. Yes. All right, uh, well, uh, uh, number one, thanks for the feedback, and then for the second feedback there. So. Um, uh, as, as Pat said, I'm Udaya, I'm with Jump, and uh, we want to spend a little bit of time today talking about this concept of widespread empathy, and, uh, and we'll tell you a little bit of the story about where that came from and how it's sort of grown. Um, in the spirit of uh, full uh, disclaimers and disclosures, um, I grew up just over the border in uh, New York in Dutchess County, Wappingers Falls. And so, uh, so I, I'm in many ways uh, feeling like I'm back home here. So thanks for that. And I did see that some of the funny that was uh, taking place was uh, somebody doing expanded transportation services in Dutchess County. So whichever one of you did that, thank you for doing that. Thanks for keeping the place alive. So yes, you can applaud yourselves. That's awesome, right? So OK. So uh, now uh, today's talk and in, in much of what we talk about today is uh, really about violating a lot of the basic rules and norms that we may have about what it means to be a philanthropist, what it means to be a funder, what it means, it means to be a community leader. So we're going to start by violating a few rules right now, which is when you come to formal events, you're expected to dress up and sit down and talk politely. So uh, we'll start with a, a little bit of a game. Uh, so uh, to start with, it's a little bit of a game called Stand Up, Sit Down. So um, scoot your chair back just a little bit. And so let's just, we'll just use this as a, as a way to just kind of like uh, see who's here and, uh, and, and who we are with one another. So, um, so number one, uh, uh, stand up if you are, are part of a corporate foundation. Okay, nice job. Okay, yeah. so that was pretty easy, right? Okay, so sit down, please. And then uh, uh, so stand up if you are part of a community foundation. Okay, uh, stand up if you, uh, thank you, and you can sit down. Now, uh, stand up if you uh, are part of a, uh, a family foundation or, or some other endowed fund. Okay, great, all right. All right, and uh, stand up if, uh, thank you, and you can sit down. And how about folks that have been in the uh, field of philanthropy for five years? Stand up. Great, now you can sit back down again. And how about folks who have been in the field of philanthropy for 10 years? Okay, and you can sit back down again. 
And then folks who have been in the field of philanthropy for 20 years. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, uh, so, so part of that is to also say that there's a lot of things that we're going to talk about today in this field of widespread empathy that in many ways, for folks that have been in this field for a long time, you're going to say, you're saying stuff that I've known for years. In which case, that's awesome. Go do it then. And so in many ways, we're going to rely on your wisdom and expertise as we go through this and think about this today uh, to really relate this and, and make sense of it for the folks that may be a little newer to the field. Uh, and in the spirit of uh, disclaimer, I will tell you this, that uh, I have a tendency to be very excited when I think about philanthropy. As, as uh, we mentioned, I worked in community economic development for years. I've worked um, in and had our own business and strategy consulting for many years as well. But I get very passionate about this field because I believe that the opportunity for you to have a massive effect both on the communities that you work in as well as the society and culture as a whole inside the United States and even part of uh, uh, the global work that you all do, um, I think it could be massive. I think it could be tremendous. And if you're doing anything less than massive and tremendous impact inside this world, you're selling yourself short, because you could do something great. Now, what that also means is that because I tend to talk uh, a little fast about this uh, field, so I get a little energetic about this. So if for some reason I'm speaking too fast, please keep up. So. Uh, <laughs> All right, so, so, let's, uh, so let's start with some very basic ideas, the, the concept of, of where, are we, where are we launching from. Um, from, from a jump standpoint, uh, we look at the, the, the world in a couple of different ways, and, and, and many of it comes from when companies are coming to us and asking uh, us the question of, well, tell us how we can make more money, and we always try to think about it less in terms of how do you make more money, and how do you go actually go about creating wealth, because wealth can happen in a lot of different ways, and it can happen uh, at a lot of different levels inside both individuals as well as larger corporations and society. Um, for, for the kinds of things that companies come to us to think about, it's really around questions about growth, meaning how do we grow revenue? How do we grow impact? How do we grow customers? How do we grow from being a small company to a big company? How do we grow from being a company with uh, a certain amount of impact to one that has a much greater one? So what it often means is that it's companies uh, like the ones that Pat mentioned, uh, it's folks like uh, it's Sexy names like Target and, uh, and Harley Davidson, uh, and it's folks who make the everyday things that you and I uh, use every day, like General Mills, and, uh, and, and really helping them understand what are the growth opportunities that exist. And in many of the cases, when they are coming to us and asking these kinds of questions, they're asking some very basic notions of how do I get into a new business, or how do I innovate better, or how do I actually have a long-term plan for, uh, for, for doing something more impactful in the world. And I think something that we see more often than not is the common question, which is how do we actually create an enduring source of growth and innovation that a company can use time and time again? And so how does it end up not being just a flash in the pen? And I, I, I lay this, um, this foundation uh, and base for you more than anything else to try to give you a little bit of a head torque, which is that we're going to start from the place of not talking about foundations. We're going to talk about the corporate world for a little bit. And then we're going to come back and talk about foundations. Is that OK with you guys? Yeah, OK, good. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about what that actually looks like. You know, when companies come to us and say, what does innovation look like? What does growth look like? Well, um, give us the equation of what's there. It's hard to break it down to equations, but we tend to say that, you know what, if you really want to be good at this, if you really want to have great impact and you really want to grow uh, your company significantly, there are three big components that you need to have. Number one, the idea of empathy. Number two, an issue of creativity, and number three, execution. And how do you bring all three of those things together? And while years back we were looking at this, and, 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 if, you, and yeah, if you had to decode what, what was going on there, we said, you know, there's a lot of books that exist on creativity, right? Uh, ones that are uh, on like sort of stretching your mind and Edward de Bono lateral thinking kind of stuff. So, so that feels pretty well populated for how we can, you know, quote, unquote, think outside the box or whatever cliche you want to put on it, right? Uh, there's also a lot of great books on execution namely books that are called things like execution. And so 
they're also great books, and you should go and procure those if those are of interest to you. But what we found more than anything else that there was a profound lack of understanding about what it meant to really have empathy. And that became a journey for us at Jump, um, and an investigation that started many years ago because we saw it happening with uh, many of our clients. How are they actually being successful? How are they actually building a sense of empathy inside their organization? And we found a bunch of different things happening. So um, to start with just as a definition, when we say empathy, what we're talking about is something very simple, which is the ability to step outside of ourselves and see the world as other people do. Very simple. And starting from that, we started to see a, a lot of different patterns going on inside corporations. And it's what led to the publication of Wired to Care, uh, which is a, 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 not just a, a book that was uh, published back in 2009. Uh, it was published by our CEO. And in full disclaimer as well, my CEO is my brother. We started the company years back, so not like I'm shilling for the book or anything, but, uh, but it really is actually a fantastic book. And, um, and I, I say that simply to say it really started to bring together a lot of the amazing thinking that had existed inside different corporations and organizations and governmental groups about what it meant to have empathy inside organizations and what it meant to use empathy as a real driver for change and growth. Um, and where that kind of took us was a couple of interesting spots. So um, we talk about the concept of what empathy really meant, uh, meaning individual people all having this this sense of empathy. Um, but then we actually expanded it and said, you know what, based upon everything, everything that we're seeing, it's not just about empathy. Uh, because, because in many ways, we're all wired to have empathy. Uh, we all have some innate sense of how we can relate to another person. So, so that has always existed. But it's really about something much wider than that, which is the idea of widespread empathy. Meaning, how did you not just have empathy yourself, but how did you scale that to your entire organization? Organization. How did the entire company have empathy? How did the entire governmental group have or, um, uh, empathy? And how was it appropriately and systematically scaled inside organizations? And that started to become very, very relevant. So we started seeing it showing up in a lot of different ways. Um, uh, folks who have kids at home, just raise your hand, you don't have to stand up or sit down. Okay, folks who, uh, whose children play video games, okay, and folks whose children own an Xbox. Okay, right, okay, so here's the thing. Um, uh, if, if you know the video game space, right, there are, there, are things, there are things like Xbox, and then there are things like Wii. Folks who have a Wii at home, right, you often play that with your children, perhaps? Yes, okay. The Xbox, you are thoroughly confused by all the controls on it? Yeah, right. That's on purpose, okay, why? Uh, because, uh, because they basically, when they went and created the Xbox, they created the gamer's device. This was the one that all the, all the, 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 the folks who really, really loved playing video games and a specific kind of video game, this was the kind of thing that they really wanted to do. So, so you know, the, uh, the, the, the real sort of almost violent and gory but real action-packed kind of video games, that's, what, that's who they designed that particular console for, right? And so Microsoft, which had nothing in video games, immediately launched what has been one of the most successful video game consoles in history. And you look at that and you say, wow, how did you go from zero to, to 60 like that? How did you go from nothing to something significant? Well, the way they did that is that all the people who worked on the Xbox team were avid video gamers themselves. So in many ways, they were not designing for some random faceless group. They were designing for themselves. What was the thing that they really wanted? What was the video game system that was really going to thrill them? And they said, great, let's build that perfect system for us. And that's why in many ways it was successful. And you can read great stories about that, including the ones uh, in the book about that. But then that same team went and they created an interesting device after that. And it was called the Microsoft Zune. How many folks have a Microsoft Zune in the audience? Okay, how many folks have an iPod? Okay, now, the Zune came out as a competitor to the iPod. They said, okay, well, I, Apple seems to be very successful in this music space. We can be pretty successful with a music player. And they launched the Zune after that. And, and the problem was the Zune was really, didn't really take off. It was a testament to the fact that just about nobody in this room actually has one. And now, you know, now what that means is this. Why did you go from creating such a great product like the Xbox, which, which kids love and it was really perfect for gamers, and then you went and created the Zune? Well, 
in, in the case of the Xbox, as they say quite proudly, um, uh, we weren't designing for them. We were designing for us. We were those people. Versus in Zune, they didn't really know who they were designing it for. Is it some random person? Is it something that, 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 that were they real music aficionados themselves? No. And so we saw a massive break in the empathy that was there. They didn't know who the people that they were serving really were because they were not them and they were in the first case. So we looked at that and we said, okay, so, so there's some real germs and some real uh, interesting and seeds of ideas there. So the pattern exists not just in places like Microsoft, it exists in corporations all over the world. So uh, folks, uh, any motorcycle riders in the audience? Yeah? Yeah, good, all right. And what do you ride, sir, in the back? You ride a Harley. Yeah, good for you. So. Um, <laughs> So, so here's the thing. Uh, if you uh, if you ride, uh, you know you can ride like uh, like uh, like speed bikes or sport bikes, like like uh, like like the Suzuki's or or um, what have you. And then there are a lot of folks who are real big fans of of the Harley Davidson motorcycle. And and here's the thing. What we found is that it's not about necessarily folks who are just like like thrilled about riding. There are people inside this world who are die-hard Harley fans and don't know how to ride a motorcycle. Right? They've never even been on a Harley Davidson. That's okay. They are big fans of whatever Harley is and what it represents, right? And you look at that and you say, well, how have you been so successful at this? Well, if, uh, we see the concept of empathy showing up in places like this as well. So this is Harley Davidson headquarters in, uh, in, uh, on Juneau Avenue in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And those are all motorcycles that are kind of parked out uh, there. And here's a couple of interesting things. There's a um, uh, there's a sign there, motorcycles only, no cages. What's a cage? Car. Cage is a car, that's right, why? Because it locks you in and you are about freedom, young man, and you should get on your motorcycle and ride, exactly. Yeah. So, and, and so when they go about designing motorcycles, when they go about creating a great bike, they are all about making sure that they have something great for the riders. Now, you look at that and you say, okay, well, is it a bunch of people who are designing for a them? No, just like in the case of what we saw with Microsoft, it was that they were designing for themselves. And so, uh, so there, were, there are constant reminders throughout Harley-Davidson of what it means to actually des design and really be in the mindset of somebody who is a a Harley enthusiast. So if you walk around Harley Davidson headquarters, there's a conspicuous smell of leather everywhere, right? And I'm not joking about that. Um, and, and you walk into conference rooms and they have a nice glass top and they're sitting on top of V-twin uh, engine uh, supporting this thing, right? Um, uh, there is a, every, every part of the company has been, has been uh, centered around telling stories about riders, about themselves as riders. Um, and, it, uh, and it goes on a couple of different levels. So, um, so so what you end up finding is that Harley Davidson not only has a lot of props around and a lot of, uh, of, of means to tell their story to one another, but very, very importantly, they incentivize it as a company. If you're one of the top 50 managers at Harley Davidson, you are required to attend rallies. You are required to actually go and hang out with riders in some sort of organized fashion, and it's part of your performance improvement, uh, performance plan. If, if, if you are not actually hanging out with them, plan on getting dinged on your performance review next year. They're taking it that seriously. Why? Because they want to have that one-to-one -one connection constantly uh, uh, maintained. As, as, uh, as uh, folks at Harley told us, it's not like there's a riders and, and then there's Harley Davidson. It's we are them and they are us. We are one and the same. Okay? And so that, uh, that uh, uh, concept of empathy came through as well. We saw it in places like Nike as well. You know, when you, when you go, folks who have been to the Nike uh, campus in Beaverton, Oregon, no, okay, yeah, so you've seen it in the back, uh, uh, the guy in the back there, you've seen it as well, which is, you go there and it's sort of like someone like, uh, like took a big college campus and took out all the boring academic buildings, but left all the playgrounds there, right? So like, so there, there are fields, lots of fields, there's like the largest climbing wall you've ever seen, the most number of speed bikes, there's a massive track that goes through the entire area, both for, uh, uh, both in, uh, for, for cross country running and for, uh, uh, and for uh, track and field sports. It's, they have their own lake there. You can test windsurfing stuff if you want to. I mean, it's really a tremendous facility. But more than anything else, it's because they live and breathe the sports and the athleticism that they are espousing every single day. So you walk into the largest uh, enclosed structure um, in Oregon. It's the Mia Hamm building. And who's inside the Mia People know who Mia Hamm is? Yes? Yeah. Right. Okay. Who's Mia Hamm? Soccer, yeah, 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 superstar soccer player. And so you walk into the Mia Hamm building. Who works inside the Mia Hamm building? 
Folks who work on soccer, and let's also be clear, they don't just work on soccer, they work on football, because that's what we call it in, the, in other parts of the world rather than the United States. And they live and breathe it every single day, meaning that you not only work inside the Mia Hamm building, and there's memorabilia, and there are exhibits all throughout the entire space, but there is in, 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 in every single floor, it's named after a famous soccer stadium, and then in particular parts of that floor, they're named after other famous players. So your, uh, your address is not mail code, 1F23D, your mail code is Mia Ham Wembley Pele 3, and that's how people know to go to your particular spot. They live and breathe it every single day in what they do. And as a result of doing that, as a result of, of, of leaving that work on a constant basis, they make pretty darn good decisions about what a soccer shoe should be like, what a football shoe should be like on a daily basis, because they're living it every day. In many ways, they're not just des designing it for themselves, they really have a close understanding of what's going on uh, with the rest of the world. A couple of interesting things to do that, that they do that, uh, that we also saw is that they would even do things like saying, you know what, we need to really understand what it means to be a Brazilian teenager who's a big fan of soccer. Let's actually go and create an entire display area where we re recreate a Brazilian teenager's bedroom here. So we get a really deep sense of what their life is like on a daily basis and be able to make better decisions as a result of that. And that's many ways why Nike is successful at it. Okay, so Harley Davidson, Nike, we see it in places like uh, like IBM as part of the, the Lou Gerstner turnaround. You also start to see it in companies that ne who don't necessarily have a strong sense of empathy. Um, so, um, and I'm going to pick on these guys for a little bit. So, how many folks uh, fly on planes? How many? Keep your hands up if you love it. Right, yeah, okay, right. Now here's the thing, I kind of like, like get a little bit of a thrill out of every time because I'm like, oh my god, I'm flying, right, you know, which is generally a kind of a cool thing, right, you know, like I'm a bird, whatever. But in many ways, you look at it and you're like, why is it that air travel is so awful, right? Well, if you go, to, like, when we've talked to them, the executives at Delta Airlines, like, they really look at everything and say, why, there's really nothing wrong with air travel nowadays. And if you look at them, you're just like, oh, are you crazy? Like, do you not, like, have the same hor horrific, completely, like, like dehumanized experiences of, of air travel that I do on a daily basis? And the answer is no. They don't have it. Because if you're an exec at, at Delta Airlines, your headquarters is where? You're right next to Hartsfield-Jackson uh, Airport in Atlanta, right? Okay, so, so, so when you've got to get on a flight, your admin calls down and you, you, you go down to a private screening that exists inside your building there and you put your stuff to the screen, you get out on the other side of that thing and, you know, uh, they, they then put you on this little private bus and that little private car kind of takes you over to the plane and, you know, there's some stairs there and you walk onto the plane and you walk right into first class there and they hand you a drink and you sit down and you're like, okay, let's go, right? Honestly, like if air travel was like this for the rest of us, we'd be like, yeah, let's get going. We love being on planes. But it's not like that for the rest of us. So consequently, they don't have that same sense of what's wrong with air travel. They don't have the same sense of what they need to do to improve air travel because they're not living it every day. So you see what the examples of folks that are high empathy and they understand what a real business traveler is going through and folks who are really low empathy. And consequently, the decisions that they're making and the results that they're getting are the same, are, 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 are uh, constantly lower. So what does that mean? We saw with companies with widespread empathy a few things. Number one, they blurred the line between the inside and the outside. Remember what I said about Harley. We are them and they are us. Okay, there's no, there's no distin uh, distinction between them. They think like the people who are their customers. I work on a, on, on a football shoe at Nike and I have a, I have a real sense of what the customers uh, uh, of that shoe and, what the, and the people who wear those shoes are actually going to be doing with them, what their lives are like. They surround themselves with information about the outside world. The the pictures of the rally that exists at Harley, the Brazilian teenagers room that exists in places like Nike. They're often not that great at research. It's not that they spend time commissioning a lot of reports, and that's okay because they have enough of a gut sense of what really good looks like, and they can kind of take it from there. It's not necessarily very touchy-feely. They're absolutely rigorous about it, and, and, and making sure that people very much stay true to that vision, it doesn't necessarily need to be something that's very soft. So we saw this going on with companies um, uh, in many different 
different ways. And what did it actually give them? The intuition to feel a vibe before they actually saw it. So they just had a gut sense of knowing that they were actually right about things and they didn't necessarily need that confirmation from the outside. What it also meant was that those companies that really had widespread empathy had a lot more passion. And they had a lot more passion to take a leap on something that was new or something that was different. They also had to, the courage of their convictions, which meant that when things started to get a little shaky, that's okay. They're like, you know what, this is the right way to go. Let's stay the course on this. And then finally, they really, more than anything else, they had clarity and they could make decisions faster. And you see this in a lot of corporations where people are saying, well, let's just go commission another study to see if this thing is right. And you're like, really? Everybody knows it to be right. Why don't we just go and do it? Well, we don't do it because we just don't feel like it's the right thing because we have not spent the time out in the field really understanding that. Okay, so what did that mean therefore for, for all of you? We ended up creating something called a, an empathometer, which is basically folks that were really high empathy and folks that were really low empathy, and then the striving ones that were sort, sort of in the middle. So folks like Harley and, uh, and Nike were uh, on the high empathy side, and then you had folks like Delta in the, in the low empathy side, and then you had a lot of folks who were sort of striving in the middle. Folks like Target and folks like Procter and Gamble uh, and, and HP and, and uh, what have you. And so, so that started to really just tell us a little bit about um, what kinds of growth we can expect, what kinds of, of results that they can actually deliver. So that was really interesting. And, uh, and, and, it, and it sort of led us to kind of peel back the onion just a little bit and say like, all right, so what does it mean in terms of how we really are viewing the entire space of, uh, of empathy? Well, from a biological standpoint, let's get a little scientific and let's get a little geeky about it, right? Which is that you know, the, the brain is made up of a few different parts. There's the, there's the neocortex part of it, uh, you know, which handles all the, the, the higher order uh, functions, the limbic system, um, uh, and the reptilian brain. And the reptilian brain is all about the fight or flight uh, kind of responses. That limbic system, though, was something that uh, became incredibly fascinating for us. And why? Because that's the thing that started con uh, to control all sorts of functions around, like, how do you actually relate to other people? How do you actually connect with other people? And in many ways, it's where empathy was living for, uh, for many folks. It's why when you think about it, you know, like your dog knows that you've had a, uh, a really bad day. How is that? Because dogs have incredibly sophisticated limbic systems. You can neurologically look at it and understand it that way, right? And, and in many ways, the, 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 the problems that we kept seeing over and over again is that, is that whereas dogs uh, had incredibly strong limbic systems, that isn't as exactly true for all of the animal kingdom. Um, so iguanas, for example, treat each other like furniture, right? Like, like, like if you're a baby iguana, what once you're born, you should probably run away as quickly as possible lest your mother eat you, right? So now here's the problem with that. They have absolutely no empathy for one another. They don't even relate to each other as iguanas for goodness sakes, right? And the problem that we kept seeing over and over again is that we were creating a space of corporate iguanas, right? Ones where we had absolutely no sense of, they had no sense of connection to the people that they were serving. They had no connection uh, uh, to the fact that, 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 that folks like Enron were actually playing with, uh, uh, with people's retirement accounts and, and being uh, rather cavalier about the whole thing. Um, and in many ways we found it was because uh, they were uh, basically asking us to check our humanity at the door. So we all know that we have an Olympic system. Why were we turning it off when we walked inside the doors of these corporations? Um, and what were the opportunities uh, that, that we could uh, get to? And we've even hard-coded it into our culture, right? Like for any of you who've worked in the corporate space, you notice they'll say things, oh, it's not personal, it's just business. Well, damn it, isn't business personal, right? Aren't we all people here? Like when did we forget that? And, and when did we become non-sentient beings that started to have these transactions? It doesn't necessarily work like that, right? And so when, uh, what we started to see was that companies with widespread empathy didn't do this. They weren't the ones who were simply saying, uh, it's business, it's not personal. Um, and so we said, okay, so that was interesting from a corporate standpoint and the, the, the kind of folks that could be there. Now let's kind of bring it back to foundation role for a little bit and see like, like how it gets uh, back to us. So uh, you've worked in the space for a long time. And so let's do a little bit of a, as we might do, a, a, an honest appraisal of ourselves. Yeah, right? <clears throat> Which is... Um, foundations copy the worst habits of corporations, right? Um, in many ways, we live inside a bubble of relative opulence. We have money and other people don't necessarily have the same money that we do. Uh, they spend little time experiencing the lives of their beneficiaries and from all the research that, that we did in first-hand accounts, um, there, there was a strong sense of that they really understood foundation role, but they didn't necessarily understand the communities that they were trying to talk. Um, 
in many ways, you know, that like we've, we've tried to improve that, you know, and yet programs like the stakeholder engagement kind of a, a trend that started to come up, you know. But, but more than anything else, empathy was still really residing at an individual level, not necessarily at a widespread level. And we saw that over and over again um, in Foundation World. And so um, we started to see that with some initial work, and that led to some, uh, uh, some much more in-depth work that we started doing a few years back, looking deeply at philanthropy and how issues of widespread empathy were actually able to uh, show up in the film topic world. So uh, we created a little bit of an empathometer for you guys as well, right? And so um, you had folks that were really high empathy, you had folks that were really low empathy, and you had folks that were sort of striving and sort of, sort of in the middle of that. And so uh, the low empathy folks, uh, they tended to be the big folks, you know, the, the Kelloggs, the Rockefellers, you know, the, the Carnegies of the world, the Ford Foundations. Um, the ones that were really high empathy, they tended to be ones that were really uh, a lot more community focused, a lot smaller sometimes, uh, but more than anything else, real pinpoint focus uh, on what they're doing. And then you had a lot of folks that were in the striving uh, of, uh, column. Folks who really wanted to do something um, uh, uh, really significant and really saw empathy as part of the way to be able to do that, but they hadn't necessarily built all the systems in place to do that. Um, and so we, we uh, ended up starting to see a few different things. And um, there's, I think more than anything else, we start to see this a uh, little bit of a bifurcation, right? There was not just empathy as a general concept, but there's empathy on a couple of different levels. Empathy for communities that really needed it, the, 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 the benefiting populations, the people who could, who could really uh, use not only the money that we were giving them, but, but, but really their lives would be benefited from it. Um, and then the idea of empathy for grantees, the nonprofits that we were giving our money to. What were the, what were the results that, uh, that they were able to have, and more than anything, could we have a deep sense of what was going on inside their lives? And so we saw both of those starting to exist in foundation world, saying, well, how are they linked together, and what kind of empathy do we really need? Um, I think more than anything else, from a widespread empathy standpoint, that point about individual empathy came back over and over and over again. Um, you had program staff who, who could say, I am deeply tied into what my community is doing. I am deeply tied into what particular grantees need. But it wasn't necessarily systemic. It hadn't been scaled throughout the organization. And so uh, I want to put a bug in your ear about that, which is we're not just talking about you as individuals being highly empathic individuals. What we're really talking about is how have you scaled that throughout your organizations? How have you made it the way that business gets done? How have you uh, made it the way that you are wor and your staff are working on an everyday basis? And I don't just mean the program staff. I mean the executive directors and the CEOs. I mean the CFOs. I mean the folks who work in finance, the folks who work in IT, the folks who work in HR programs. Every single person in the organization having a deep understanding of what grantees need, of what benefiting and, uh, communities and beneficiaries need. And not only having that deep sense of what they need, but really understanding, therefore, what are the most appropriate solutions for them. And that really started to like, 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 like move things for us. And we started to see what were the patterns for how organizations were starting to scale that sense of empathy inside themselves. So what did it really look like? Well, we saw a, a bunch of different things. Number one, we saw better results. Um, change occurs more quickly when you actually have widespread empathy inside your organization. Uh, grant makers respond in real time to think that they are, are actually observing the field. You see a problem going on and you can take action on it very, very quickly. Innovative solutions really start to take hold. Um, uh, 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 foundations that really uh, start to have widespread empathy were totally fine abandoning programs and abandoning practices that weren't necessarily moving the needle for them. Um, philanthropy actually started to become more efficient and more effective at getting money out the door because review cycles started to shorten. You had a much better sense even before the community walked in the door of what was going on and whether or not the things that they were asking for were going to be in line with actually moving the needle inside their communities. And then finally, the nonprofits themselves were stronger. The ones that, uh, the, 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 the grantees that we were giving money to because we're giving money in the right way because we're able to customize how we actually support them, they were actually able 
able to succeed a lot more effectively than, uh, than not. And so we started to see these results um, uh, in, uh, in foundations that really start to have widespread empathy. Okay, so it led us to some f so five basic principles about how to go about creating widespread empathy in the organization. I'll, I'll ask this just as a basic question. We uh, published these results with GEO, uh, the Grant Makers for Effective Organizations. Um, it started with some work uh, a few years back and then the publish publication came out last year. So folks who have actually read the GEO publication, raise your hand. Okay, good. So homework for the rest of you guys. Um, uh, please go and read the publication. It's free. It's available. It's downloaded. You can download, download it off the GEO website. You can download it off the JUMP website, uh, what have you. Um, and I think more than anything else, it'll give you a much better sense of what each of these five particular areas uh, look like and, uh, and, and w what the steps are to start to create widespread empathy inside the organization. Um, again, keep in mind what I said before. This is not just about the individual. This is about creating the overall systems for change inside the, in, uh, inside the foundation. So, uh, number Number one was the issue of make it about others, not about you. And we saw this with organizations like the, the, the Charles E. Bennett Foundation um, in Wisconsin, where uh, they went to their local chapter, Feeding America, and basically said, um, you know what, here's how we are currently dispersing money to you. And they said, yes. And we said, and we look at the fact that, like, that funding is kind of drying up for you guys uh, in other places. What can we do to make your life a little easier? And the, the nonprofit was stunned. They're like, what do you mean, what do you want to do to make our lives easier? They said, how could we change what we do to better fit what you need? They said, okay, well, honestly, if you gave us the money in, like, these sorts of disperse and this kind of a disbursement schedule and ramped it up here and ramped it down there and had it evenly spaced in the beginning of the year versus at the end of the year, that would really help us. I said, okay. Great, let's just go and do that. And it was a very simple change, and yet was incredibly important. Why? Because nonprofits are always trying to manage their cash better, and when you've got like variances and lumpiness in your funding cycle, you can't necessarily actually manage your cash well. So being able to actually have a flexible process and system for things like disbursement was incredibly important for them to be able to survive as a nonprofit. And so we saw it in places like, like Bennett as well, um, uh, with, uh, with, with larger programs, because they could actually get money out the door faster. Um, uh, raise your hand if your foundation actually uh, gave money after Hurricane Katrina to do some rebuilding in, uh, in the Gulf Coast area. Okay, right. Um, and how fast did you get your money out the door? Pretty fast? Pretty fast like a week? Pretty fast like a month? Or pretty fast like a couple of days? A week? Yeah, a lot of folks say uh, that, that they got their, um, their money out in a week. And you look at that and you're like, well, great, so why could we get the money out a week when it was, the, when it was Katrina? Because, oh my God, it was so horrible. Um, but so many of our cases were taking much longer than that to actually get our money out the door. We take weeks upon weeks, if not months, if not quarters, to actually get the money out the door because we're vetting the hell out of these applications. Really? Do you really need to do that? Is that really so critical? Putting ourselves in the mind of what our grantees really needed versus what we, uh, we really needed. Because uh, to be assured that while Katrina was a one-time event and really quite horrible, those sorts of big cat catastrophes are happening on a daily basis, not just, uh, not just a right in this uh, immediate vicinity here, but in the two Connecticut's that exist between rich and poor, which I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, number two, get out of the office. Um, anybody know this guy, Bill Somerville? Tremendous guy, runs a foundation out uh, in California called Philanthropic Ventures. And uh, he has an interesting thing, which is uh, when, whenever he's trying to make funding decisions, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't uh, go off the paper. The first thing that he does, he says, okay, that, that particular nonprofit or service uh, could, uh, could use some funding. Let me go and essentially mystery shop it. So I'm just going to go and use the services there. And so he's going to he's gonna go fund a soup kitchen. He's going to go eat at that soup kitchen. He's going to tell them that who he is. He's just going to go and eat at that soup kitchen and see what it's like. Understand what the, what, the, what the people who actually access the services are, understand what the nonprofit actually functions like. It's a hell of a lot better than trying to actually put together the application. But more than anything, he's doing it even before the conversation starts because he's using it to keep tapped into what the community is doing. So by actually getting out there and being able to tap into what's there, he's able to find much better funding opportunities and get his money out the door not only a lot quicker, but have a lot more effectiveness as a result of that. <clears throat> 
Number three, bring the outside in. Uh, so as important as it is for you to get out, it's also important for you to bring the outside world back into it. Meyer Foundation in Washington, D.C. is a great example of that. When they built their, uh, uh, their, uh, their new space out, they located it pretty close to a metro stop, um, and they situated their conference rooms in such a way so that a lot of nonprofits could just come and use it for free, but they also made it so that you, it wasn't just isolated from the rest of the building. They made it so that for all of them, uh, they could see the nonprofits themselves circulating throughout their offices there. And so what did it create? Well, because you had grantees and you had, and you had benefiting populations walking through your entire office there, there's a constant conversation. There's random occurrences where you're like, hey, I hadn't talked to you about this. Let's have a conversation about that. Or a, 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 an overwhelming need start to come into the, uh, and kind of seep in through the walls there. So you ended up having much uh, better dialogue and a much better discussion with the people that you were serving more than anything else because you had, you were really highly tapped into what was going on because they were inside the offices every day. What it also meant is not just from a facility standpoint, that you also started hiring uh, uh, folks that had worked in nonprofit corporations to be inside the foundation so they would have a deep sense of what nonprofits need because they just came from that world. And so when they come into foundation world, they're not trying to like play by an entirely different set of rules. They're actually able to say, you know what, this is really what grantees need out there and then redesign systems appropriately. Uh, invest in what it takes. Of, I chose a uh, Connecticut uh, uh, foundation for this one, uh, and uh, and uh, I, I think I think more than anything else, uh, what uh, what Grostein did in terms of having community advocates, folks who can work inside uh, um, inside the communities to actually help them connect with funding sources, independent of whether they're actually working with Grostein, is just is just absolutely phenomenal, and it's exactly what we start to see in a lot of different foundations that it didn't become about a one-to-one -one relationship between you and uh, the grantee and say, well, you know, either we're going to be your funder or we're not going to be a funder. It's more of a question of what do you need as a nonprofit, what do you need as a, as a, as a grantee to be able to succeed. And now if that means that we need to put more money into it to be able to support a program that actually will uh, uh, have these advocates working side by side with you inside your community, we're willing to do that. That's a good way for us to spend money. And so in many ways, the concept of invest in what it takes is important because it puts a financial uh, uh, amount of metric on this thing and, and encourages you to actually uh, put your money where your intent is. And then finally, lead from the top. Uh, the Geraldine R. Dowage Foundation, uh, a great example of this. Um, the, the, this kind of work doesn't necessarily just happen at the lowest levels of the, uh, of the foundation. It has to uh, be all the way from the very top. Um, and what that means is that the leaders of the foundation have to be able to sit there and say, these are the kinds of changes that I want to see happening inside the, uh, inside the foundation. So what does it look like? The, the, the leaders are able to then say, look, let's actually incentivize folks to be able to do this, meaning that uh, the, the HR evaluations that we have for program staff look a lot like the ones that Harley Davidson had, where you are actually, you are, uh, you are rewarded and your performance is better, is recognized when you are doing things like having, uh, like spending time in community. So what does it look like? It means that there are requirements for how much time you're spending in the office versus out of the office, and it means that you're actually uh, uh, a fair amount of time spent on, uh, on, uh, on incentivizing program staff and everybody inside the organization to, uh, to, get, uh, to get out and, and and not just be like limited by the uh, the systems that uh, currently exist. When you are leading from the top like that, you have a much uh, better chance that programs around empathy and widespread empathy are actually going to succeed and not just uh, show up as this is another initiative that you're actually going to uh, uh, have. So uh, the five, make it about others, not about you. Number two, get out of the office. Number three, bring the outside in, number four, invest in what it takes, and number five, lead from the top. All of you should have a card at your table, right? Like, like a card right in front of you, right? So it kind of looks like this, yeah, right? Okay, so here's the thing. If you, uh, so flower on the front, flip it over, and on the back, uh, those are the five steps. So you constantly have this thing, right? So, so now no excuses. Um, uh, so here's what this really means. Uh, like we've left a little bit of a space at the bottom of this thing um, so that you can actually like uh, write your own notes. I encourage you uh, as you have conversations over lunch, as you have conversations throughout the rest of the day, and even, uh, uh, and, uh, even just as you're leaving today, jot down a couple of notes about how you can actually make uh, these five principles show up for yourself inside your organization. Maybe you're going to go back and you're going to say, you know what? 
want, I'm taking everybody inside the organization on more site visits and having them embedded with nonprofits uh, that, that we are funding. Fine, maybe that's one thing that you're going to do. Or maybe you're going to spend a lot less time doing sort of windshield tours in your community and more time just actually like eating food with them side by side in the, you know, in the diners and restaurants that they are actually eating in and, uh, and, and, and having an understanding of what it's really like. Um, maybe you're going to do something where uh, you are uh, you're, you're, you're going to really bring the outside world in and you're going to find opportunities to bring in all of those uh, uh, different voices uh, to be a better part of your particular group or reconstitute your board so you have uh, more uh, um, uh, grantee voices on there, what have you. Any of those are great things to put on there. I encourage you to write those things down, but I will ask you this. Write it down before you leave today. Don't make it something that you're going to go back to the office and write it down. It'll take you 10 seconds, and so just make sure that you uh, uh, take a note of that before you go. Um, <clears throat> Final thoughts, and then we'll get into uh, Q&A if you have any. Um, uh, which is, why do this? What's the real importance? Of it? Like, what's the big payback if you do this? Well, we saw with corporations, the ones who succeeded were, were tremendously uh, financially rewarded. Uh, they were rewarded from a brand standpoint. They were rewarded from a loyalty standpoint. What does it look like for philanthropy? And what does it look like if you do your job right and you're able to actually get empathy uh, and much a deeper sense of widespread empathy throughout your foundation? Well, I think in many ways like the, the, the results have to be what I said in the beginning, which is you could have a tremendous impact. You could have a significant change in the way that we think about not only philanthropy, but, uh, but, but how we develop our communities uh, and, and society as a whole. So, so start thinking about it in bigger terms. The idea of you actually start funding the next Apple, the next Intel, the next Google of nonprofits. That's the way that you need to start thinking about it so that we were the ones as a, as a, as a foundation that gave them the money so that they could really go into orbit and do something fantastic in the world. Um, it means that outcomes are actually happening too fast for you to measure. So you're not actually obsessed with things like metrics and whether or not people are like, checking off little boxes on a scorecard. It doesn't really matter because the outcomes are happening so fast and it's obvious to everybody uh, that, 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 uh, that you don't have to really like, focus too much on that. Um, it becomes so that you as a foundation, your advice becomes more valuable than your money itself because you have such a deep sense of empathy of what's going on. People are coming to you and saying, you know what, like, we, you have such a deep sense of what's going on inside this community. Help us understand what they need and help us understand what we can actually do about it. And, and, and you know, like, Let's put something bold out there where other foundations actually want you to acquire them because you're so darn good at doing exactly what you're doing. You're like, you know, like, why have three of us doing it? Like everybody kind of roll into one and we'll pull our resources together and have a much bigger, uh, bigger impact from what's there. Um, all different op options for what can come out of it, but I, I encourage you to think loftily about what that uh, impact really could look like. Um, and I think as you think about widespread empathy and trying to put some of these steps into place, uh, I do encourage you to, uh, to think about not only the impact of what you can have, uh, but how you can do that using a real deep connection to what other folks in this world really need. So um, thanks a lot for your time. So, so I think we have time for a couple questions. So, so a couple questions, and I think uh, Pat's running around with a mic, so uh, let's give her a cardio workout for the day. And uh, if you do have a question, she will run the mic over to you, and uh, you may speak it all the way in the back, Pat. Like, you see, like, oh, I should have brought some Nike running shoes for you, and then you know, just kind of we'll just uh, be able to do that. Okay, good. So, uh, so we'll take a question from the back. Go ahead. And if you could just say uh, who you are and also your organization, please. Hello. I'm Elizabeth Krauss. I, I work with Pat Baker at the Connecticut Health Foundation. I, I really appreciated your talk today. Uh, the Connecticut Health Foundation invests in systems change strategies. So ultimately, if you travel downstream, we are trying to improve health for underserved populations. Yes. And, and so I think it is absolutely possible to increase our empathy, but when our, our level of intervention is at the systems level, how do we gain more empathy for how systems work? Yeah, uh, it's a good point. And so, so I think what we have found over time is that uh, the, the, an empathy for systems, specifically in the healthcare space, and I personally do a lot of healthcare uh, uh, innovation and strategy work myself, so I think what we find is that 
the, the systems of healthcare and the decisions being made about it are not being made at the patient level. They're not being made at the doctor and nurse and clinician level. They're often being made uh, by folks uh, in an IT role. They're being made by folks in a facilities role, in a, in a, in a tech or in a, uh, um, in, a, in a med tech role. And so um, a lot of that is about how are you spending time with those particular decision makers and how much do they know the kinds of impacts that you really want to have. So um, what I would encourage you to do is, uh, is kind of like the, take the, the, the second principle, the, 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 the Bill Somerville principle of how you can actually, uh, actually get out there a little more. So how much time are you spending with the administrators and the system staff that actually work in hospitals uh, versus uh, the, the, the doctors and the, you know, and, the, and the nurses that might be there? Um, other questions from the back? Yes. Uh, in, in the center here. I'm Andy Boone from the Netter Foundation. On one of your slides, you had um, that decision making is not touchy feely yeah. for successful uh, organizations that are going with their gut, more yeah. or less. But you encourage us to be out being touchy feely and bringing people in to feel us. So I'm wondering if you could explain what you meant. How do, how do you resolve touchy the touchy feely paradox, as it were? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, so, so let me be very clear that uh, when I say that it's not touchy-feely, um, it, it means that you don't just spend time out with communities just hearing sob stories, okay? And, and let's all be very clear. Why do you all get into philanthropy, right? Because you have a profound sense of the need to do right. You have a profound sense of wanting to help other people. You have a great deal of compassion in your lives. We're not talking about just plain compassion, though. What we're talking about is an understanding of needs. So you have to be really rigorous in your understanding. So the touchy-feely part of it is not just, hey, how are you doing? And do you need a shoulder to cry on? I think that's important. But it's also really important to say, let me see the books. Let me actually go through and actually go through with you and understand what are the dynamics of what, uh, of what your nonprofit is working like. Uh, what are the dynamics of the community and, and, and how are the different uh, influences and drivers in the system affecting change there. So when I say uh, don't just be touchy-feely about that, I mean don't overcorrect and think that empathy, empathy is about compassion. Empathy is, is really having a deep understanding of every part of what's going on in a community, sometimes at a very quantitative level, sometimes at a qualitative level, but it is an understanding of how all of those different parts are, are really driving connections so that you can start to see things that they are not necessarily seeing. Does that make sense? Great. Okay. Other questions? In the back? Yeah. Over there? Hi. I'm Juanita James from the Fairfield County Community Foundation. Welcome. I had a curious question about your high empathy, striving, low empathy slide for the corporations. Yes. <laughs> and wondered how Unilever, uh, your interpretation of low empathy. When I think of Unilever, I think of the work they're doing with the Dove products around women and self-image, and yeah. so I was just surprised to see them in the low empathy column. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree with you. They have amazing pockets like that, and the problem with, uh, with them is a problem with a lot of organizations, is that it's just stayed as a pocket. Um, and Unilever is a, uh, people know who Unilever is, right? So they make soaps, they make shampoos, they make deodorants, but they also make food, um, things like, uh, like Lipton teas and, and uh, things like that, that's, that's all Unilever. Um, um, uh, Helmut's mayonnaise and things like that, right? And so, um, and so, the problem with uh, with Unilever specifically is that they have not found a way to endemically spread that inside the organization. So there are no systems for doing it. You're not rewarded for doing it. Um, I've been in the room with folks uh, there, and I'll, and I'll I'll speak candidly, where you know they're they're. Uh, we're showing them some video of a woman talking about making meals for her family and how she, um, how she you know, is uh, using different ingredients to prepare it and, and she's using a lot of, uh, of uh, ragu tomato sauce. And so they make ragu tomato sauce with one of them. You know. And literally, there's 10 people in the room, all working from, uh, from them, who are listening to this woman's story and they start laughing at her. You're like, why? Like, and so we, we stopped the tape. We're like, what's so funny? And I said, oh, gosh, she's this ragu. I mean, like. <laughs> <laughs> like, you freaking make ragu. Like, are you kidding me? 
Okay, here's the problem with them. All the folks in the room, like they're, you know, it's, it's, they're, they're in Jersey there, and so like all the folks in the room, like like live in New York, and, and they get paid like reasonable amounts of money. So they eat in high-end places, like like all throughout Jersey and New York, and throughout the tri-state area. So they don't actually like go home and make a lot of like ragu for themselves because they just go out and eat Italian food. But the rest of the country eats what they are making, and the problem with it, and the real disconnect for them is that if you're getting to a point where you're making fun of your customers for the crappy product that you're actually selling, <laughs> even though they're the ones who are funding your 401k, there's something definitely wrong with that situation, is what I would say. Personal opinion. So, now, now here's the thing. Now, let's, I, I don't want to bash them as a company because we put them as striving, meaning that they're trying with things like Dove, and I think that that's important. And they've got to scale it up, and I think that that is important too. But what it means is that you've got your own ragu story inside every one of your foundations, right? You've got something where you look at and you're like, oh, God, that nonprofit. Oh, I can't believe they did that. Yeah, right, right. It's probably your fault. 